we can just go ahead and jump into our last guest. Senator Rosemary Bear joins us here on the Mega Cast. She, of course, represents District 12. Senator, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, Ronnie. It's always good to be here with you both. Hello, Tyler. There are so many things uh, for us to uh, touch on. Do you want to just jump in? Let's start with the budget. How are things sure, looking there? Kind of been consuming so much of my time lately. Honestly, it's uh, really an interesting thing to work on. I'll say that uh, we were sort of locked in a room together for a couple of days this week, as trying to get the, uh, the the set of all the budgets from the for the state out of the Senate. So the process, just to really quickly remind people what it is, um, the governor sent uh, a draft proposal for the budget earlier this year to the House and the Senate. Each of those two houses comes up with their version of a budget. The two houses come together into one version that then kind of goes into that final round of conversation with the governor's office till we get one budget. And the goal is to have it done completely by the beginning of June so that the schools in particular know what to expect for next year. And um, from, from a new guy's perspective, right? This is, I'm starting my third year here. This is the first time that we've actually done it this way where we might really get it done in June, which is kind of an exciting thought and will really make a difference for our schools. Yeah, I know a lot of superintendents that would make them very happy because it makes it hard for them to plan when they don't have the budget. And everything is so different right now because of the COVID-19 crisis and the additional money that is coming in because of that crisis. Exactly. They can't even rely on what they did last year. This year is nothing like last year. And then last year is nothing like the year before that. So everything is about planning right now and trying to figure out their next steps. And so not knowing how much money they're going to get from the state, we're, we're sort of got estimates on what will happen with the federal money, but even that might be wrong. And even as they've talked about the next set of uh, supports coming out of the federal government, again, the word education is coming up. So uh, we may get more, more support yet. So that's good. I mean, it gives people the opportunity to think of things in the immediate need space, right? We know there are many things that have to happen because of the virus and all the recovery that we have to do, learning delay to overcome um, but also gives the opportunity to think about longer term investments. Are there things that we could actually do differently or major changes that we've been wishing we could do? So it's pretty exciting for the education space in particular, this, um, the ARP money that's the America's Rescue Plan money that's supposedly coming in shortly um, is $4 billion for our public education system just that one piece, 10 billion for state and local government. So that's a that's a lot of money coming in that we didn't have last year. So it makes a big difference in our budget planning. So we sat and went through all the budgets. So that starts with, you know, school aid is one piece of that. The Department of Education has its own budget. There's a DNR budget, at Eagle, the Great Lakes Energy and Environment budget. Um, every single health and human services is our single biggest component. It's about half of the state money much of which is prescribed by the federal government. There's only a smaller part of that that we can actually decide what to do with. Much of it is already determined in advance. Uh, but then all the other budgets, the general fund has everything from corrections to um, the governor's office to how much we spend on IT to how much, you know, so many things fit together. So we, I am uh, the minority vice chair on the school budgets, the school aid budget, as well as the Department of Education. And so we spent a lot of time on that. We actually worked together to put together a draft, um, you know, the two parties in the Senate side uh, to put together a draft for the, the approvals last week. And we um, really, it was, it was exciting. We had to increase the um, allowance, the foundation allowance by, over $300 million for this year, which was even higher than what the governor had proposed. So that was pretty exciting. Um, an additional 41, over 41 million just for special ed, an increase in special ed funding, um, increases 20 million in mental health, um, improvements in childcare, improvement, you know, making it more available to families, um, offering more uh, compensation for the providers. For teachers of great start, we have um, increased the foundation allowance for the for great starts preschool to be the same as kindergarten. 
So, uh, which is good. I mean, all the studies show that it actually costs more to teach four-year-olds than it does five-year-olds, but at least now we've gotten them to the same. So in the Senate version, there's many, many good things that are improved. We kind of got surprised by something at the very end that we didn't expect, and so we couldn't pass it uh, uh, from the Democratic side. We're hoping that that can still get fixed um, by the time it comes to the floor next week, and we'll have agreement on that. Most of the budgets were contentious, there were, you know, not always, there's not always agreement on how things go when, you know, we're both sitting in the appropriations room together. Um, but the one thing that happened that, that was overarching, I think, uh, outside of the school budgets, the idea was we fix our staffing at levels from last December. And, and so in all the budgets were cuts on uh, FTEs, which means reducing the size of of the services, the, the level of services that each of these departments can provide. So for example, when you cut people in the Secretary of State's office, that means longer lines, longer waits in the Secretary of State's office. And it's that basic, right? That's a people-driven business. And so they decided to freeze the number of people at the end of last year. And the problem with that is there was a hiring freeze for the eight months before that. And so we were already way understaffed and now we're frozen and cannot even get back to where we were a year ago. So um, there's definitely some things that need to get adjusted. So that last two phases, one working with the house and then the last one working with the governor's office, um, hopefully we will get past some of those kind of issues because we still need to have secretary of state's offices open. I mean, we can't literally close those. I mean, it would be interesting if we could do everything online, but we haven't been able to do that, obviously. Um, so there's, there's still things that we haven't agreed on, but it is a fascinating uh, way to work and, and sitting there, you know, kind of negotiate between two parties and now between two houses and then between the administration and, you know, it's all negotiations all the time. But it's good to see, or at least it sounds like the two sides are negotiating because we have seen there's been such a divide between the GOP and the Democrats in Lansing throughout this pandemic, especially around restrictions in schools. Yes, and we did do a lot of work together. I, it, you know, it's not perfect. I, I at least on the school side, um, we, we did work together and, and things are, are better. I, it is not true in every part of the government. Um, because they're run by pin committees and committees have chairs and, you know, different ideas on how things should go. Um, so that, you know, some are better than us. One of the challenges that in one of mine that, that I work on is the environmental budgets. So the um, Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy and the DNR budgets. Um, we live in Michigan and we are the water state. And we have are experiencing, like many others, like all other states probably, the, the problem that we're having with aging infrastructure. And so um, in 2002, the people of Michigan voted for a clean water fund so that we could update and maintain water infrastructure and make sure people have access to fix things when they break, like septic systems or sewer systems, or just to be able to have clean water coming to your well. And so um, the governor had proposed that we use that money that was approved in 2002 for a clean water fund for grants for anyone across the state to fix their broken systems, whatever that is, to repair their infrastructure so they have clean running water and a way to dispose of water effectively. And that got taken out. And, and that was just a huge, like, you know, to my heart, no, that's our water. You have to take care. We have to take care of our water. So we're going to fight that one as hard as we can. <laughs> <laughs> get yeah, that back in there especially to do that you know in the middle of the pandemic we've all come to appreciate our environment so much more than i think we have in previous years yes honestly we just depend on those things so much so and we are more and more you know i also work on transportation um which we did a great job on that one too there's there's some differences that you know as an environmentalist I really favor rail transport as much as possible. So they did a little squeeze on that and I wanted to unsqueeze it. Um, but overall it was a good, you know, good work. And, uh, um, and because we know that we have infrastructure that needs to be fixed and the governor had proposed some work right now, as soon as possible, getting some of these bridges that are actually some of them failed 
others critically failing that I wouldn't want to drive over. Um, and so it looks like that's going to happen. So, you know, so there is, there are good things. There are places where really good things are happening, other places where we have more work to do. So if I can ask you, because when we're talking about the budgets and the money, I wonder about our future generations, because I know a lot of people say, oh, it's federal money. At the end of the day, it's all tax dollars. It's all our How money. many generations are going to have to pay for the money that we're receiving today? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I will say, when you think back, if you are a historian and looked at, at, at Roosevelt and the New Deal that he put in place after the war, right? We were so, people were so desperately needing some, some work. They need, you know, we're in that, we, they, there was a, a, a dire lack of infrastructure work going on. And so by putting those programs in place, and, and in that largely, these are very much the same kinds of programs, right? We'll have, people will have jobs that will pay good enough, right? I mean, this is how our economy as a whole needs to recover. So even outside of the, the cost of the pandemic, the, the, we have been seeing a decline in people's real actual take-home pay for uh, more than a generation. And what's happening is people then have to work two jobs or in sometimes in a family, three jobs. And then one of those jobs just pays for childcare because we're not paying enough. I mean, we basically have to up-level the whole economy to get us to the place where everybody's earning an income that pays their bills, right? And then we're all moving forward again. So this is sort of like unsticking. And at the same time, we are going to repair and replace the infrastructure that we've let sit there for 80 years that's failing. I mean, so we are, it's a double win for us. It will move everything forward, which is how our economy repairs itself. You know, the way we're going now, we're not going to repair anything. We've got to change directions a little bit here. We're talking with the uh, state Senator Rosemary Bear. She uh, represents the 12th district. And I will say if people actually saw the, the ratings for the bridges, they'd be very afraid as well. Um, and I don't know if uh, you, you know some industry can make those public. I know before I've had to FOIA them and it really is eye opening yeah. uh, when we look it's at that. It's kind of scary when you think about where you drive every day. It really is. It really is. Just another minute or two here with you um, on the Megacast. And when you're talking about the jobs, right now, though, we're seeing such a shortage of employees and some businesses are having to reduce hours or, you know, um, some in some cases closing all together because they can't get enough employees. Yeah, that, that actually ties to what I was sort of leading into there with the conversation about compensation. Um, if you are making more in unemployment than you would from your paid job, what that really is telling us is your paid job is not paying enough. Now, right now, there's a boost on unemployment from the federal government, which is helping. But even then, I mean, most uh, most uh, uh, professional workers would never be able to survive on that on that weekly pay. It's, it's not enough to survive on. Ours, Michigan is one of the lowest in the country for what we actually give people for unemployment. So you, they, together with the federal boost, you're making less than $600 a week. It is very difficult to live on $600 a week. And if you have a kid, if you have two kids, if you have three kids, you know, so think about that. So your, your employer is asking you to come back for less than $600 a week. So uh, with that, we should point out uh, there are so many great opportunities, school opportunities right now being made right. available through the state of Michigan. And uh, what a great opportunity. And let's a hope people take, take advantage. advantage. Take right? advantage of that. Yeah, and Michigan Works, who you just had here as a fabulous organization, um, they too have upscaling opportunities. They do apprentice programs. They work with different organizations to help people raise themselves to a level where they have a skill that will help them with that particular thing. So yeah, overall, I mean, if we add all those pieces together, this is really a big opportunity for us to invest in the people of Michigan and make a huge difference to what's been happening here. I, I think we're looking at a, a future that is bright and near term. 
And, you know, and a lot of times that's what happens out of a crisis. We see mm -hmm. these silver linings. And well, was it never, never pass up the chance to take advantage of a crisis or, uh, you know, something like that. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, with that uh, state senator, we know that it's Mother's Day weekend this uh, weekend. We want to say happy Mother's Day uh, to you. you. Uh, and enjoy the time. Uh, just about uh, 10, 20 seconds left. Anything? There, I have so many things I want to ask about, but we're out of time. I but... know it goes by so fast. Um, the only thing I will remind everyone is to get vaccinated because that will this is the thing that is going to get us out of this as a state. We need to get as many people through that. One, we want to protect all our people. Two, we would like to get to that point where everything opens back up fully. That's that's our big goal, and we are close. We're over 52% have had that first shot. Not that much farther to get us to 65%. We can do it. There you go. And it's easier now uh, than ever before.